Today marks the 60th anniversary of Bajan Li's passing. It's good to reflect on our Ajans. We're practicing their teachings. So it's good to reflect on the type of people they were, so we can inspire ourselves to see whatever virtues they had we can develop within us. When Ajahn Fung talked about Ajahn Li, the two features stood out. One was what he called his large-heartedness. He wanted to make the teachings available to a lot of people. He wanted to help a lot of people. When John Lee wrote down the Divine Mantra, and he said that when you're reflecting on the Buddha, you reflect on his purity. When you reflect on the Dhamma, you reflect on Sariputta and his wisdom. When you reflect on the Sangha, you reflect on Moggallana with his psychic powers and his compassion. And John Lee did have a lot of psychic powers, and the purpose was compassion. He helped people with their poverty, he helped people with their illnesses. When he go into the forest, it wasn't just to have some, a good time in the forest, have a little seclusion. He often went because there was somebody there, even out in the wilderness, that he had to help. But before he did that, he had to make sure that his own practice was solid. And that was the second feature that a John Fu would talk about. And John Lee approached the practice as a skill, Ouija, or Ouija in Thai. And John Lee himself would often draw these parallels. Meditating is like making clay tiles. Meditating is like being a good cook. Medita meditating is like taking silver and learning what you can do with the silver. It's like learning how to sew a pair of pants, weave a basket. In all the cases, you commit yourself to the practice and then you reflect. There's that passage in the canon. It's strange that it appears only once, where the Buddha says the Dhamma has to be found through two qualities, commitment and reflection. And these are precisely the qualities you need as you develop the meditation as a skill. You commit yourself to the practice. You put in the hours. You put in the effort. You're sincere in what you do. And then you watch what you do. You step back to see how you're doing it, see how well you're doing it. You have to develop what's called an all-around eye, or as a John. Lee would express it, circumspection, Guam Rob Cobb in Thai. It's a quality of alertness. When he described mindfulness practice, he said alertness is like a pulley, that you pull in one direction, then pull in another direction. You look at the breath, then you look at the mind. Make sure that both of them are snug. And this is how you turn your practice into a skill. On the one hand, you keep looking at what you're doing. You look at the results, and then you don't blame the results on the weather. You don't blame them on outside factors. You say, there must be something I'm doing that's not quite right if it's not right. So you watch what you're doing. When you're focusing on the breath, how strong is your focus? When you're holding a concept of the breath and mind, what concept are you holding in mind? And the best way to ferret these things out is to experiment. You look at the various ways that John Lee has of explaining the breath energy in the body. Those all come from experimentation. And part of experimenting is to flip things around. That's what he said was the, the key to make sure that you didn't get involved in what are called the corruptions of insight. 
you latch onto something as being true, you have to ask yourself, to what extent is it false, and to what extent is the opposite true? So you try things out. Otherwise you have an idea that X must be true and you hold on to it. And when you decide you've confirmed it for yourself and then you hold on to that, you've got some strong attachments. Take, for instance, the teaching on not-self. And John Lee has a really interesting way of approaching it. He says you take what is inconstant and turn it into something constant. You take what is stressful and turn it into something easeful. You take what is not self and you get it under your control. You see this in two areas. One is when he's talking about concentration practice. Your mind, which is flitting all over the place, you make it into a mind that can stay in one place. The sense of the body as you feel it from within, which has its aches and its pains. You find where its potential for pleasure is, and you maximize that. This is one of the John Lee's real contributions. So the Buddha says, you breathe in and out sensitive to rapture, breathe in and out sensitive to pleasure. He doesn't say how. He also says once there's rapture and pleasure, you allow it to spread throughout the body. He gives an analogy, the analogy of the bathman working the water through the pile of bath powder, or the lake in which the waters from the spring lake spread through the water. But he doesn't give any more explanation than that, and John Lee talking about the breath energies in the body provides a really good clue. You get so that you can saturate the breath with good energy, saturate the body with good breath, saturate the body with a sense of ease. This is how you turn your concentration into a skill, become something that is under your control. Then, he says, then you begin to realize that even that thing that you have, that which is now constant, easeful, and under your control, even that has to be let go. Again, through reflection, you begin to see that even it has its subtle inconstancy, stress. There is where it's not fully under your control. But you wouldn't have known that if you hadn't pushed in the opposite direction. The same with discernment. You develop the discernment that sees through your attachments. It shows you how you can let them go. And then you have to let go of that discernment, too. As he says, when there's the insight that all dhammas are not self. You have to turn around and apply that to the, that insight, too. It, too, is not self. It, too, is to be let go of. Because remember, we're not here to arrive at wisdom or arise at discernment. We're here to arrive at release. The release can't be total unless you let go of everything. But you let go in stages. As John Lee said, first you abandon what's unskillful and you hold on to what's skillful. And as you saw, as you do that, you're going to be developing a sense of self around that what is skillful. Well, you have to do that. There are people who say, well, if you get the mind centered like this, you're trying to get it under your control, and there's going to be a sense of self. We know that everything is not self, therefore you have to not try to get anything under your control. That doesn't work. You have to approach this strategically, and as John Lee saw that. So there will be a sense of self involved in getting the path together. And then you let go of what's skillful. As he said, Nibbana has, has no need for right views or wrong views, has no need for views at all, has no need for truths at all. Remember, the word truth can have two different meanings. One is a statement about facts, 
and the other is a fact itself. And you use the statements to arrive at the fact itself. But the part of arriving will mean that you have to let go of the statements too at some point. So these are the things you learn through being circumspect, through reflecting. So when we think about it, John Lee and all the good that he did, all the good he did for other people, all the good he did for himself. It came from qualities like this. And these are qualities that we can emulate. This is the whole purpose of recollection of the Sangha. To remember, they didn't simply follow orders. At the same time, they weren't out there being totally creative. They committed themselves to what the Buddha said had to be done. But they realized that in order to do it well, they had to reflect, they had to be circumspect. And it's when they were really circumspect like this that then when they helped others, they had something of solid value to offer. So as we appreciate the things of solid value that we've learned from Ajahn Lee, at the very least we want to make sure that we can develop them within ourselves. And if we have the time and opportunity, we're happy to pass them along. But make sure they're solid in, within you first. Make sure that what you've got can stand the test of turning around and looking. What are you doing? Is what you've got good from all sides? Try to develop that all-around eye. And that's how the Dhamma is passed on. Partially through the words, but primarily through the qualities of the heart. <laughs>